Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Hope you're having a good, uh, a good couple of days here at our convention, Federalist Society. It's my, uh, it's my privilege uh, this afternoon to introduce uh, U.S. Senator-elect Mike Lee from, from Utah. U.S. Uh, Senator Mike Lee opens his online bio with the following sentence. Mike acquired his love for the Constitution early on while discussing everything from the Due Process Clause to the Second Amendment around the dinner table. <laughs> this guy is serious. <laughs> now, lest you believe that this is a mere rhetorical flourish, I have it on very good authority from people who saw and heard Mike on the campaign trail that he spent much time talking quite seriously and quite specifically about the limits on government power contained in our Constitution and why they need to be respected. One current U.S. Senator, who I won't name and whose accent I'm about to butcher, said to me, Lannard, he's actually out there talking about the Commerce Clause. Well, yes, Senator, and I suspect you'll be hearing lots more about that very soon. <laughs> Mike Lee served as the president of our BYU Law School chapter, and perhaps this explains his campaign speeches, but it wouldn't be fair for us to take all the credit. He did, after all, clerk for Judge Sam Alito on the Third Circuit, and his father, Rex Lee, was a brilliant lawyer who served as Solicitor General of the United States under President Ronald Reagan. Please join me in giving U.S. Senator-elect Mike Lee a warm and hearty welcome. Thank you, Leonard, for that kind introduction and for the opportunity uh, you've given me to speak to one of my very favorite groups. <clears throat> you know, the introduction reminded me of the fact that uh, when I first started campaigning, people would look at me kind of strange when I uh, mentioned the fact that uh, we would discuss this sort of thing around the dinner table. I think I was uh, almost um, uh, 38 or 39, which I now am, before I realized not every family talks about the presentment clause over potatoes. But <laughs> Uh, to me, that sounded perfectly normal. Um, the United States Constitution and many aspects of U.S. history were something of a second religion in our home. Uh, we, we discussed these things constantly. I, I remember initial conversations with my dad about Roe versus Wade when I was about 10 years old. He explained the basic facts of the case, the basic elements of the holding, and as he finished explaining it to me, I, I, my response to him was that separate and apart from the insult that this presents to the dignity of humankind, it uh, overlooks the fact that there's absolutely nothing in the Constitution that makes this a federal issue. I was really bothered by that issue at, uh, at that age. Um, I, I don't think he realized I was weird either. Uh, <laughs> I decided to get into this race and to run for political office um, because I've come to believe that our federal government is too big and too expensive. I doubt there are many in this audience that will disagree with me on that point. But just in case, just in case there might be a few of you out there, I'll remind you of the fact that we have a federal government that has accumulated almost $14 trillion in debt to this point within a year's time, we will have reached a $15 trillion debt. That's a lot of money. There are people in the United States of America today, people right here in the District of Columbia and across the northeastern seaboard, certainly people in Utah, who do not make $15 trillion in an entire year. <laughs> it's true. Sad but true. You divide $15 trillion by 300 million Americans, it works out to about $50,000 a head. A lot of people don't make that much money in a year. You divide it by the number of taxpayers we have in this country, and it's well over $120,000, $125,000 per taxpayer. Now, that's a problem. 
the debt that we're acquiring is unsustainable. And of course, it gets even worse when you stop to consider that we have unfunded entitlement liabilities that have been estimated at anywhere from 70 to $100 trillion. Some say it's even more than that. Uh, we don't know. But the part that we do know is sufficiently disturbing to cause us to realize we have a problem. And it's a problem that harkens back to an earlier time in our nation's history, an earlier time a couple of centuries ago, when Americans started expressing concern about a distant, powerful national government. Not based in Washington, D.C., because it didn't exist then. This was then part of Maryland. But a national government based in London. And that distant, powerful national government taxed us too much, and it regulated us too heavily as Americans. It didn't respect that quintessentially American principle of local self-rule. You know, the idea that people govern themselves better than government does, and where government is necessary, uh, most government decisions are generally made better at the local level than they are at the national level. And this national government was so far from the people that it was slow to respond to their needs, even when it did respond. And so the people came to an understanding that feels somewhat familiar to us, that national governments, by their very nature, do have a certain tendency toward tyranny. They have a tendency to become tyrants, ultimately, unless their power is carefully checked. And that remains true, this tendency toward tyranny that national governments have, regardless of whether the national government in question is headed by a king on the one hand, or by an elected president, or even by an elected president who thinks he's a king. <laughs> Unless we restrict that power and put careful boundaries around it, Tyranny will ensue. It's an inevitability. It is the nature and disposition of mankind that this will happen. And so we as a country decided that we would reject this kind of national government. And after we became our own country, we put together our founding era document. And we decided to come up with a list, a list of powers that we knew we had to have in our national government. We put forward that list in Article 1, Section 8, you know, with very, very few exceptions. Every power that the federal government has is found in Article 1, Section 8. This all important, but uh, all too frequently overlooked portion of our Constitution. So we decided to give Congress the power to regulate uh, things like interstate and foreign commerce, to take care of our national defense issues, to develop laws governing immigration, what they called naturalization back then. Uh, to establish a uniform system of weights and measures, to declare war, to regulate federal public lands in certain circumstances subject to certain limitations. And there are a few others, including my personal favorite power of Congress, the power to grant letters of mark and reprisal. We don't talk about that one as often as we should, although we do in my house. Uh, <laughs> My, my children, James, John, and Eliza, have, have, have come to regard that with great affection. But in case you, you missed that one in your last family discussion, um, a letter of mark and reprisal is basically a hall pass issued by Congress in the name of the United States that entitles the holder to engage in state-sponsored acts of piracy on the high seas in the name of the United States of America. And if it's the last thing I ever do, regardless of... Um, how long I might serve in the United States Senate, I'm going to get a letter of mark and reprisal. And I'm gonna be a pirate and you can all join me. My point in all of this is to underscore the fact that within that document, within this charter for our national government, there is no power to do all things that Congress deems expedient. There is no power to make life fairer, more equitable, more enjoyable for Americans generally. There are instead limited enumerated powers, which James Madison, whose name this society reveres, as do I, described the powers of the federal government as few and defined. Whereas the powers of the states, those reserved to the states, those lingering aspects of sovereignty, can be presumed to exist in the states 
unless they're not in here. That part was already implicitly clear in the main text of the Constitution. It was, of course, made abundantly clear without any ambiguity or uncertainty in the Tenth Amendment. And yet, we are where we are. And yet, since the New Deal era, every single year, the combined expenditures of the 50 state governments has been significantly less than the expenditures of the federal government. It was never true before the New Deal era. It has always been true ever since the New Deal era. I trace this back, most of it, to the changes that occurred in our jurisprudence, our Commerce Clause jurisprudence, in the late 1930s and early 1940s. With cases like NLRB versus Jones and Laughlin Steele at the outset, and then culminating with Wickard v. Filburn, uh, the court has been following that now famous, infamous, I say, uh, standard of Congress may regulate any and every activity that when measured in the aggregate, when replicated across every state, can be said to substantially affect interstate commerce. Well, we as lawyers know that that's just legalese for a very simple concept. Congress may regulate any aspect of human existence. And yet, there is not a single point upon which we can be more certain that the Founding Fathers all agreed than that they were not creating a federal government with general police powers. They were not creating an all-purpose national government. Not one of those men would have signed their name to this document, and not one of those states would have ratified the document had they believed that what they were creating, what they were ratifying, was anything other than a limited-purpose national government. Now, I, I have been told since high school that I need to bury the hatchet when it comes to Wickard v. Filburn. <laughs> My high school history teacher, uh, who was fantastic, used to say, Mr. Lee, just get over it. The federal government's big. We all benefit from it to one degree or another. That ship has sailed. Leave it alone. I don't want to. I don't think I can. You see, because the things that were true in 1787 remain true in 2010. In fact, I dare say what happens now, what we're experiencing today, is the best evidence that those guys were right we wouldn't be in a position where we'd be facing a $15 trillion debt with $100 trillion in unfunded entitlement liabilities if they simply respected this, these basic precepts, if they stuck to the program, if they focused on those things that they're supposed to be doing. I mean, look, there's only so much you can spend granting letters of mark and reprisal, right? <laughs> the solution, I believe, lies not in attempts within the federal judiciary to roll back Wickard v. Filburn. Don't get me wrong, I would love it if that happened. And I applaud those states that have attacked President Obama's health care plan uh, in the courts on the basis that even under Wickard v. Filburn, this thing obviously crosses the line. Uh, a, a standard which I thought had no limits uh, may in fact have them when it comes to Congress telling the American people that they have to buy a specific product that they may not want, that Congress in its infinite wisdom can tell them what kind of health insurance they have to buy under penalty of federal law. I applaud those efforts. I don't believe that they can return us to what I refer to affectionately as constitutionally limited government fast enough to get us out of the mess that we're now facing. I believe and hope and expect that in time we will have a Supreme Court uh, in, in which a majority of the justices will decide that the standard adopted in Wickard v. Filburn utterly obliterates the enumerated powers doctrine and renders dead letter the Tenth Amendment. Until that time, what do we do? That's where I believe we can do something that won't have to take years or even decades to complete. You see, because we have, as it turns out, not just one branch 
in our federal government. We've got three. And only one of them is controlled by people with lifetime appointments. The other ones you can vote for. The problem has been that in the political branches over the last 75 years, as members of Congress in both houses of both political parties have seen that the Supreme Court's answer is always yes, really with only two exceptions. United States versus Lopez in 1995 being one, and United States versus Morrison in 2000 being the other. With only those two exceptions, every single time the question has been raised in that court, does this exceed Congress's commerce power, the answer has always been no. The answer has always been yes to Congress. You can do this, and nothing the courts will do will interfere with your ability to do that. So members of Congress have stopped asking the question of whether they can, because the answer is always yes. They stopped asking whether they could, and then they stopped asking whether they should. Forgetting, of course, the fact that under Article VI, each member of Congress is required to take an oath to uphold the Constitution. In my mind, that means more than doing that which you can get away with in court. Look, we drove over here in a taxi cab just a few minutes ago from my temporary space up on Capitol Hill. I don't know whether the cab driver exceeded the law, lawful speed limit at some point. He may have, he may not have, I, I wasn't watching. But the fact that we didn't get a ticket on the way over doesn't mean that he was complying with the law. It just means he didn't get caught. So too with Congress, especially when you consider things like the non-justiciable political question doctrine, when you consider the fact that in many circumstances, very few people, if anyone, can be said to have standing to challenge certain actions taken by the federal government, certain federal spending programs, especially when you consider that a lot of suits never get brought because of the perception of futility. It's not fair to say that just because the courts scarcely, rarely interfere with Congress's exercise of authority, that Congress and members of Congress are complying with their oath to uphold the Constitution. What I'm saying is that members of Congress need to be held accountable and need to hold themselves accountable to their oath, regardless of what the courts might be willing to enforce. That that needs to become part of the American political discourse. The question whether each member of Congress or each candidate pursuing an office in Congress will independently police and independently limit the exercise of congressional authority out of respect, out of devotion, to the principles of the American Revolution, principles that were embodied in our founding era document, principles that have been utterly ignored, I believe, for the last 75 years from within the political branches of government. We must expect and we must demand more from our leaders, but it will not happen until we as voters start the discussion, until we commence what I call the constitutional debate. Now, when I first decided to get into this race to, to run for the United States Senate, I wondered, as a lawyer, am I geeking out on this to the point that I can't see the inability or, or ability, perhaps, of, of the voting non-lawyer public to grasp the importance of this. And so in a few initial speeches before I even became a candidate, in audiences throughout my state, I ran the basic history of Wickard B. Filburn by them. I explained to them uh, basically the, the origins of the Commerce Clause uh, and, and, and how its interpretation had evolved over time. People got it. They understood it. I continued with those discussions after I got into the race, and sometimes my campaign staff have to get after me. They, they actually put down some pretty harsh rules. Uh, they told me that in most circumstances I could cite only one case in one speech and I could refer only one time to a specific identified clause in Article I, Section 8. So I found all kinds of ways of getting around that. But the point is, people listened. And people without any, any legal education can and do grasp these things, and they grasp it well. This is something that the American voting public can and should and must, and I believe will understand. Because it may well be the only way that we can get out of the current mess that we face. For the principal reason that a renewed emphasis on federalism, not just within the courts, not just within government, but 
among the voting public at large may well be the only nonpartisan, non-threatening way that we can address some of the problems that we face for the simple reason that at its core, it is neither Republican nor Democratic. It is neither conservative nor liberal. It's just quintessentially American. The idea of local self-rule is an American idea. And it's one that allows us to remain agnostic on many of the most fundamental and sometimes contentious questions that we face in government. Questions including such things as, what, if any, is the proper role of government in the provision of health care? There are people on both sides of the political spectrum, both extremes of the political spectrum, who I believe could find uh, areas of, of common agreement uh, with, with what I'm saying. For example, there are people to the left of me politically who would say that the only way out of our current health care crisis is to establish a single-payer, government-run, government-funded health care system. I want to be clear, I'm not one of those people in case there was any mistake. There are those who feel that way, and many of them are just as adamantly hostile toward Obamacare as I am. Then there are other people who say government should never, ever get involved in the provision of health care to the citizenry. That ought to be up to private institutions, uh, elements of civil society, to families, churches, and, and so forth. Regardless of where you are on that spectrum or whether you're somewhere in the middle, I think it's much easier to get people to the point of asking the additional question. It's not just whether government should get involved, but at which level? Should it be at a national level or should it be at the state level? I think we can make a compelling argument, even one directed toward those to our ideological left, that would say it ought to be at the state level. Let's suppose, for example, that you are one of those people who wants a government-funded, government-run, single-payer health care system. You could do it far faster, with far more consistency, making it far more true to what you envision as the utopian ideal of the federal government uh, uh, provide, or, or of a government providing this, if it's not the federal government, but a state. There are a number of people, for example, within the Vermont State Legislature that would like to create such a system, a system that would be far easier if the federal government just stayed out of this business altogether, or at least avoided any further intrusions into the realm of what is uh, within what states control. Because, of course, it's already the unique prerogative of the states to license physicians, to license other healthcare professionals, including nurses, to license hospitals and clinics, to regulate the provision, uh, the, the issuance of health insurance policies within the state, and to establish a system of tort laws governing medical malpractice lawsuits. States can far more effectively, I believe, manage all of this risk and all of these questions if the state itself is in charge of regulating health care and to the extent government is to be involved uh, in the provision of health care uh, to make those decisions rather than having those decisions made at the national level. There are other practical considerations to be taken into account as well. For instance, the fact that due to geographic, demographic, and other particularized circumstances that vary dramatically from one state to another, uh, one state might be able to do far more for its people based on the money that it is able to bring in than another state might be able to. In Utah, for example, uh, the average health care cost per person per year is about $3,800. Here in the District of Columbia, it's over 8000 And there are similar disparities that occur all over the country. If we leave these decisions at the state level, I believe they can be dealt with far more effectively, far more efficiently, and in a manner that's far more respectful to things like life, liberty, and property that we as Americans tend to cling to because we like them. And that's the whole reason why we're here today and we're not speaking with a British accent and we don't wear wigs when we go into court. <laughs> not that there's anything wrong with that. Um, 
In fact, I used to ask Justice Alito whether we shouldn't bring back the wig uh, of the court, just to add to the decorum of the whole thing. He did not uh, bite off on that at all. He <laughs> was not enthusiastic. My hope, my motivation for getting into this race has everything to do with restoring this debate to the political branches of government. And for my part, I have pledged to my constituents at home, and I repeat that pledge today, I will not vote for a single piece of legislation that I can't reconcile with the text and the original understanding of the U.S. Constitution. Stated differently, thank you. If I can't imagine myself uh, explaining to James Madison with a straight face why what I was doing uh, was consistent with the text and history of the Constitution as it's, as it's been amended all 27 times, I'll vote no. I'll do it every single time, regardless of what the precedent says I can get away with. Because of course there is a big difference between doing something that's consistent with the text and history of the Constitution on the one hand, and on the other hand, doing whatever you can get away with in court. There is a big, big difference, and it's a difference that I will honor. It's a difference that will guide me and will guide my every vote as a U.S. Senator. My hope is that by making this part of the American political discourse, as it once was, and as I believe it was for the first 100, 150 years of our operation under the U.S. Constitution, we will, as a people, be able to come to some consensus as to what powers might belong more properly at the state level. This doesn't mean less government overall, necessarily. This doesn't mean that we can't provide certain, uh, certain services uh, to provide a social safety net to people, but it may mean that we refocus our attention away from the federal government in some instances and toward the states, that we'll be pushing some power outside the federal government where it will be received by the states. We need people willing to push that power out of Washington, and we need people on the other end within the state legislatures ready to pull it back within the states. They can do it. I believe they will do it. And I believe that if we are to succeed as Americans, if we're to get out of the awful debt crisis in which we now find ourselves, we must do it. And I invite all within the sound of my voice to join me in this cause, to restore that great constitutional debate to this great republic. May God bless the sovereign United States of America. Thank you very much. We're going to Senator Lee is going to take, we have time for two very, very quick questions, and they need to be short questions so that we have time for an answer. So in the back right there, Mike. Um, congratulations on your uh, election, Senator-elect Lee. Uh, my name is Steve Sanders from Tulane Law School. I had a question for you. Um, there's a debate, you know, about the proper role of uh, senators in the confirmation process of uh, the federal judiciary, whether senators should just sort of make sure that uh, judges, uh, when judges are sort of competent and not cronies, or whether they should really scrutinize their beliefs and possibly filibuster them if they don't hold up. Uh, I was wondering what your thoughts are on that. Well, look, we're, we're not there to just check a box. We're not there to look for obvious pathologies and say, has this nominee ever been convicted of a federal felony offense? Okay, the answer is no, that's a box checked. Um, did this person graduate from law school and pass the bar exam? I, I think we're there to do more than that. And in, in my case, um, that will include uh, a, a thorough examination into whether or to what extent each nominee understands his or her commitment to the Constitution, to the laws of the United States. Uh, I'll be looking into a commitment to the whole idea of textualism. This old-fashioned notion that our laws consist of words, and our words have meaning, meaning that if ignored, that if bastardized, will lead to anarchy. And uh, that's, that's what will guide me. Thank you, Senator-elect. Senator-elect, uh, who do you perceive in the Senate 
will be a ally of your pledge to examine every piece of legislation based on this constitutional uh, litmus test? Well, we, we've got a few there already who feel this way, including, and I, I want to be very careful here that I don't run afoul of the uh, expressio unius des exclusio ulterius problem. Um, so this is a CEG reference uh, only. That went over really well on the campaign trail, I'm sure. Yes, yes it did. Yeah, that was another rule we had, no Latin. <laughs> but I told my staff today, look, I can geek out all I want on this one. These are my people. Um, So my CEG references would include uh, uh, Jim DeMint from South Carolina and Tom Coburn from Oklahoma, among others. And, and among the, the incoming freshman class, they would include, again, among others, uh, Rand Paul from Kentucky. Uh, Rand and I are going to be great friends. I look forward to working with him. Uh, uh, Marco Rubio from Florida, Pat Toomey from Pennsylvania, um, Rob Portman from Ohio, uh, Kelly Ayotte. Uh, from New Hampshire, and, 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 and there are others as well. So th this, is not, um, this is not something that's unique to any one senator. Unfortunately, it, it has been too rare. Fortunately, it will be rare no more. Thank you very much. Senator Lee, we look forward to uh, having you here in, in Washington and uh, uh, at uh, many of these gatherings as, as well as others. Thank you very much.